Hello, and welcome to the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. Today, we are here convening our annual dialogue series during the spring meetings at the IMF to feature African views and African voices on development issues and to advance Africa's agenda in Washington. Last October, I traveled to the 2023 annual meetings in Marrakesh, Morocco. Our guest was there as well. These meetings were the first IMF World Bank annual meetings to take place in Africa in 50 years. Six months later, we're here in Washington in the IMF's main atrium. At those meetings, I heard directly from senior officials exactly how low-income and vulnerable middle-income countries continue to face multiple economic shocks while seeking to build and ensure sustainable growth without talks over long-term efforts to reform the international development architecture continue. Our 2024 Spring Meetings Dialogues seeks to raise African voices during the IMF and World Bank strategic gatherings. This week, the Africa Center will host ministers from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, from South Africa, the Ivory Coast, and Morocco. Before concluding our week, we'll discuss report findings on reform of the global financial architecture towards a system that delivers for the Global South, in partnership with our partners from the Policy Center of the Global South, Morocco's largest think tank. This goal is aligned with the Africa Center's mission to prepare policymakers and investors for the onset of the African century by supporting dynamic geopolitical partnerships with African states and multilateral institutions. Today, we're joined in our IMF broadcast studios by His Excellency, Nicholas Kazadi, the Minister of Finance from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Minister Kazadi was appointed the finance minister in his country in April 2021. The minister has served as an ambassador at large for DRC's President Felix Tshisekedi. He served in a number of senior roles at the Ministry of Finance and Congo Central Bank and is an alumni of the Ecole Nationale d'Administration in Paris. Minister, 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 soyez le bienvenu and bote, welcome to Washington. Bonjour. <laughs> Mr. Minister, thank you so much for being here today. Thank we you. are here in the IMF's main atrium, we're surrounded by the buzz of these IMF and World Bank spring meetings um, at a time that is of great geostrategic and geopolitical importance. Let's get started. Last week, the IMF managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, came to the Atlantic Council and she spoke at length. In her remarks, she noted that global growth is predicted to remain slightly above 3%, which is well below its historical average. She highlighted the importance of making the right policy choices to define the future of the world economy, to avoid heading for what she called the tepid 20s, a sustained period of sluggish and disappointing economic growth. On the other hand, as I'm sure you've heard in meetings this week, we hear the most optimistic economists and investors who see African countries on a much different and I would argue a better path. According to World Bank figures, despite low growth rates of 2.6% in 2023, the economic growth rate in Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to rebound to 3.4% in 2024 and continue on an upward trajectory moving forward into 2025. So, Mr. Minister, the question I really have to start this conversation is, how is the health of the Congolese economy and do you belong to that group that's optimistic or pessimistic? Yes, uh, if uh, we have to mention the growth, uh, I can tell you that uh, our country is more resilient than, than all other, uh, including at the world level, because these two last years, the growth was around 8%, one of the highest growth rates in Africa and maybe in the world. Uh, in fact, we are taking advantage of our critical minerals, uh, for which the demand is still very strong, and uh, we want to uh, continue in that uh, trend in the next coming years uh, by uh, pushing the agenda of local transformation of those uh, minerals. And I think uh, uh, in any way, uh, con con the, the Congolese economy has a bright future, no doubt. I think you're absolutely right, and you touched on a couple different items that I, th I think we'll come to in today's conversation. Um, 
I, I think that this idea of local transformation and pushing an agenda forward that supports that is something that we work on day in and day out at the Africa Center to really build economic prosperity and push investment towards the African continent, including to places like Congo. Um, in July, well before presidential elections last year in, in Congo, the IMF Executive Board approved more than $40 million in economic support to the country to help implement development policies, address some of the macroeconomic imbalances, and, and help to strengthen economic recovery. Amid high food inflation, low oil prices, and tightening financial conditions, I'm really interested in some of your views about the concrete steps that Congo is taking to address these macroeconomic imbalances. How, what are you doing to remove some of the obstacles to private sector development, to, to boost, to enhance productivity, and create jobs? I mean, I, I think really at the end of the day, that's, that's the key. So, you know, I would love to hear some of your views there. Yes, absolutely. Now we are still, we are still remaining too much on the, our raw mineral, and that is not sustainable. Uh, it can change from one year to another and being very critical. So the uh, urgency for us now is to, uh, in fact, uh, ensure a kind of diversification of the economy uh, through first, uh, within the mining sector first, with local transformation, which uh, will need uh, uh, additional uh, energy supply mm -hmm. because we are in a lack of energy supply but also in agriculture and all the other sectors. We have a huge gap to fill, and that gap uh, is an opportunity uh, for growth and for transformation. And uh, we also have a big uh, challenge in human capital in all the direction. You are talking about job creation. Job creation means uh, having a youth uh, that is well-trained, well-prepared for job. And this is, this is also one of the challenges that we have. But in all those areas, we are investing a lot with our uh, public uh, funding. We are investing a lot in human capital, in training, vocational training and others. We are also investing a lot in infrastructure because the main challenge of our real economy in Congo is infrastructure, logistic. And also we are investing in uh, improving our supply of energy. But for the supply of energy, it is mainly a private investment that we are trying to attract because the needs are huge. Uh, we are now currently importing from Zambia over 400 million US dollars of, of energy for the mining sector. That's incredible. In, in a sector that's incredibly energy intensive, too. Exactly. Where we have the, the, the highest potential in Africa. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. And you know, as somebody who's, who's visited your beautiful country and seen how much of the economy is based on certain sectors, you mentioned agriculture, you mentioned mining. I mean, these are just two, but there are so many others. And you know, I think it speaks to the, the absolute potential that is the Congolese economy. Absolutely. And now we are also investing a lot on a special economic zone. Uh, currently, there are two on the way, but we are, uh, we are planning to have at least five or six in the coming months or, or, or years because uh, we know that the impact that a special economic zone can have in transformation, in building uh, an, industri an industry, a local industry. That's really interesting and, and something that's probably new to me but um, maybe more well known to others. I mean, we've seen, we've seen countries across uh, the South look to these special economic zones as models to sort of spur investment. You know, and I think that if you look across different markets, uh, you'll see some success and in, in some, some areas where there's, there's room for improvement. What kind of steps is Congo taking to ensure that those types of special economic zones can attract the right kinds of investment that you're looking for? Yes, uh, the, there are two, two issues. First of all, uh, there is a business environment problem when you don't have access to water, to energy, to road. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are in a special economic zone or not, you cannot do business. That's a general issue. And the second one is the fiscal uh, framework. Uh, there's no enough incentive. And, and for that, we have taken new law uh, exactly to give some uh, exemptions to uh, uh, special economic zone activities. And uh, so we are making a difference between Production, which is for export, and uh, the one is, which is for local, uh, the local market, and with all those two, now we are going. For example, in the agriculture business, 
uh, we are now uh, opening an economic zone which will transform the wood. Uh, we will, in the short future, it will not, no longer be possible to export wood without a, local trans a certain level of local transformation. The same that did Gabon. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And also on the production of many, many basic needs, basic food needs, uh, we are planning to replace gradually imports by local production because all those projects, products are products for which we have the, the, the hugest potential. It is very strange to see that so far uh, we are still importing like maize, rice, sugar in a country that can produce all of this uh, product and even export. I, I would, you know, I, I'm eager to watch this effort. I, I, I'm hopeful that there's a future here where Congo can really uh, take advantage of these efforts and, and be a, a leader for the region. I've seen some of your neighbors um, struggle with this um, interest in encouraging value-added production in sectors like timber. So, you know, it'd be great to follow this. Exactly. I think that that's great. Um, before I turn away, before I turn to, to critical minerals, because this is an important part of the conversation, and we've got about 16, 17 minutes left, I, I wanted to ask, you know, about this this issue of local transformation that you've talked about. You know, I was at mining in Daba. Yeah. Um, I heard the prime minister say that Congo's open for business. You know, looking to attract certain types of investments into the country, but in recent weeks, we've we've heard pronouncements from the Congolese government about. Uh, efforts that they're trying to do to encourage local content, local ownership, local involvement in some of the, the investments. What, you know, what's the message that Congo's trying to send? And like, how can, how can American investors, how can the U.S., how can Western investors push in the same no, direction it's, it's and a, not it's, against it's a, that? I understand there, there was an issue on the local content uh, business, but what is important to understand that we want to first uh, assure that we are really open. We, want, we are one of the most open economy. All the mining sector is, uh, is uh, driven by uh, foreign investment, not local investment. We, don't, we just want to ensure that all those partner, private partners, uh, consider sharing the prosperity with local entities and consider building local capacities. Mm -hmm. We don't even need a law for that. It's a matter of principle. If you want to be successful, successful in a country and well accepted, uh, even if there's no law for local content, you should consider having local people in your value chain, in your business, to ensure that you are going, you can go far. And it speaks to the human capital it issue. It speaks that to you the were human capital. About. So yeah. also training local people, having in the in your corporate objective, to build some local businessmen, to let them grow, to help them grow and become biggest. That's a uh, that should be taken as an obligation, even if the law, uh, you are not obliged to do it by the law. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem. And sometimes when we, take, we put the law on the table, it can frustrate a little bit. There are some misunderstandings, but I'm sure that we will overcome that. You know, I, I, you didn't say it, but I, I think it speaks to Congo's goals about long-term sustainability, right? And, and building a future that, that, that wins for Congo. So it's really interesting to hear you say that. Um, at the Africa Center, led by Rama Yad, um, who I think you've known for a long time. Yeah. She's started, we've started this critical minerals task force, and really what this is, is a focus on looking at the, what the private sector can do to drive investment, to ensure that supply chains provide value-added um, production in Africa, or look for ways to bolster supply chains that helps to ensure the most efficient outcome that creates this sustainable future. I think, um, you know, for a country like Congo that, that, that has such richness of natural resources, this is something that's incredibly important. We've, we've talked to Jacqueline, we've talked to a number of companies that are based in Congo that are taking part in this, whether it's in the financial sector or, or elsewhere. Um, but we feel that this is a, an effort that really helps push in the same direction. Um, we, can you talk about like what specific types of investments in the mining sector are is Congo looking for? And you know, what where on the energy value chain are you looking for? I mean, is this, you know, looking to create greenfield battery companies or you know, is this looking for ways to refine minerals in Congo before they are exported? What where on that value chain are you looking for investment? No, everything is uh, important. Uh, you, you can mention energy, which is very clear. 
I was, told, I was just telling you that there are 40, 400 million US dollars taken by Zambian companies, which could be taken by Congolese well, yeah, companies. Yeah, why not, right? Yes, <laughs> and the potential is there. And we are working on that, including with the US. Good. But uh, uh, that's that's big thing. But there are smaller things, like when you export uh, minerals, you have to put those minerals in bags. Those bags are bought from outside, from Zambia, etc. When we can have local ones. Right. And I met with young people, young Congolese, who wanted to do that. They, are, they were seeking for support to get one, one and a half million US dollars just for this uh, small activity. And I'm trying to help them, to push them. So there's a lot of, uh, plenty of things to do uh, uh, for which we need to raise awareness in our youth and to support them. And that's uh, the ecosystem that we are trying to build. It's not mm -hmm. easy at all, but we need to do that. And we need uh, uh, to do it in partnership with the big private sector. Yeah. yeah. I, I know you're not the mining minister, but no. uh, there is a big <laughs> mining conference coming up in, in DRC in, I don't know, six weeks or so in early June. I mean, what, what's the message, you know, if, if there are, uh, you know, if there are companies that are looking to, to come from the United States or from Canada or from the West to this, this mining conference, like, what, what's the message you want to send to them? To the mining sector? Yeah, to companies that are coming to this conference. Like, what should they know about Congo that maybe they don't? No, they should know that on the mining industry, what uh, the, the key word for us now is to bring more transparency on the value chain, to raise the standard uh, regarding uh, um, uh, child labor or anything, uh, environmental uh, standards, because uh, we know how it can affect the country if the image of your product are not, are not, is not mm -hmm. good. So we are fully working on that. And uh, uh, doing that, we hope to attract the best companies from the Western world. We, because we know, we know it's not easy for them to come mm -hmm. because they have so many requirements. Lumumbashi is uh, not close to Washington. <laughs> And we need that also uh, to invite them in the journey of local transformation yeah. of the minerals, okay. which will change completely the economy of the country uh, from uh, billions to trillions. Mm -hmm. That's the objective. Great. Mr. Minister, we've got about 10 minutes left. I want to zoom out a little bit. We, we kind of dove in there on critical minerals, but you're here in Washington. We were talking before uh, the camera started that, you know, it's uh, the weather here is lovely. It's springtime. Absolutely. You know, I would, it's always a pleasure to see you. I, I, I would love to hear a little bit about some of the, the meetings that you've had in Washington, whether it's here in the IMF, here at the World Bank, you know, with, the, with U.S. administration officials. You know, what are you hearing from them and you know, what, what's the outcome of these meetings? No, very good. Uh, you know, we are under a program with the IMF and we are, going, we are close to, to complete the, the sixth and last review of this pro the program. And let me tell you that it will be the very first time in history that DRC achieved a program with the IMF. Wow, so, congratulations. Yes, exactly. So um, the, rev the review will, will uh, officially start in the coming days, in 24 of, of April, uh, for one, or ten, one week or 10 days. And then if we are good, we will say that it is the very first time that DRC uh, managed to sustain effort to complete a program. And that is very important for us. And coupled with your economic growth, I mean, that would be wonderful. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And uh, that gives a strong signal because, as you know, we have been uh, upgraded by uh, s some of the most important rating agencies in the same period. So for us, it's very important. Same time, uh, we have uh, resumed with direct uh, budget support uh, last year from the World Bank after 15 years uh, of... Uh, uh, interruption. Uh, all this showing that there is a new economy in DRC rising and it is time to continue to support it but the main support that we want is not only on the public side, we want pri private investment mm -hmm. because that will change completely. The yeah, that's, um, that's it's very interesting to hear. I mean you're talking to a range of US administration officials I imagine. Do you, th there's and this, also it, let, you, let, me, let me mention that uh, uh, recently, in the fall 2023, 20, we joined the compact with Africa. Yes, from the German, uh, uh, the European uh, great. countries. Yeah, great. What um, you know, there's a significant amount of U.S. private sector, uh, public sector, excuse me, investment in Congo as well. Um, is there a sense that the U.S. private sector is 
is represented as well as the public sector? I mean, is there a sense that the private sector is not, is not, not, enough, not, enough. not represented enough? Not enough. We have the full support of the, the U.S. through the World Bank, the IMF, etc., uh, on the public money, but uh, not enough in terms of private investment. We are trying to do something. Currently, we are work with, working with the U.S. government on the, on the railway project. Uh, to, to export the mining, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's, it's a hot enough. issue in Washington. I'll yes. tell you that one specifically. I know, so. I know, I know. <laughs> but it's not enough. We want more. Yeah. For example, we have the project to develop Inga Inga Dam, mm -hmm. which will be the biggest dam in uh, in Africa. Uh, we need a political support at this stage, and then it will it will be followed by economic and financial support. Once we have the, that political support, things will come, and this Inga Dam will be a game changer. If we want a clean industrialization of Congo and Africa, if we want to protect our forests, we need electricity, yeah. we need trans uh, transportation, and these are the kind of initiatives that we are expecting for uh, the, the developed, country, developed world. And maybe someday a bridge uh, across the river to my former home. Uh, yes, yes, but, uh, yes. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We will get that, that also, uh, but that's another issue. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, Mr. Minister, in, in, in 2020, uh, the DRC was, uh, was reinstated by President Trump uh, to be eligible for trade preferences under the African Growth and Opportunity Absolutely. Act. Um, that program is up for renewal by the U.S. Congress uh, yes, next yeah. year, um, and it's become more of a, a political issue here in Washington. With the potential for renewal next year, what message should American policymakers, those, on, you know, the, those in, in, in Congress or work on those important committees, what should they know about Congo's vision for the future of Agoa? No, that's, you know, this is an example. The, that move huh, uh, to be renewed for Agoa was a very in interesting move from the U.S. side. But the problem, uh, we need to have some product to export to the U.S. Mm. And that is the main problem. So yeah. we need to see how we can build. That's why these economic zones are important, etc. But uh, we need to, to create those opportunities, to transform those opportunities. Yeah in being real business. We can export one, there's a lot of things that we can export, but we need to produce that first. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the key problem. Great. Um, we're here in Washington, reform of the international financial architecture has been talked about for years, for decades, right? But this seems to be back on the agenda again. The Africa Center has been doing, and, and the Atlantic Council more generally, has done a, quite a bit of work uh, looking at what the next vision of the Bretton Woods system looks like. Uh, we'll, do a re we'll be releasing a report on Friday with Morocco's finance minister, as well as two authors who have taken a deep dive as to what the governance reforms could look like and what some of the, the ways that the, the institutions could be reformed to help crowd in private capital can, mm -hmm. could look like. Uh, to create a more sustainable future that helps address some of the challenges, I mean, that that uh, many low and middle income countries are facing. We've heard from Janet Yellen, we've heard, we've heard from Kristalina Georgieva, we've heard from AJ Banga about their visions of reform, um, including a, a call for even a 25th chair um, on the IMF's executive board for Sub-Saharan Africa to help improve the voice, help improve the representation, and overall, um, balance of the board uh, with a, a bit more of an Africa um, perspective. What are some of the, the issues that Congo is getting behind? And you know, what, what reforms do you see are most critical? Uh, let me start by the most uh, simple that is uh, already almost done. It is the, the third chair for Africa, which is a very good uh, development. And now Africa will have three chairs uh, at the, the, the board of the IMF, which is very good and it will help uh, raise the voice of Africa. Mm -hmm. Even if uh, the structure of the, the quota system has not changed at all. We still remain very little in mm -hmm. power, but uh, having a third chair is, is good. Can give us more opportunity to talk. Uh, but more important is the re-channeling re of, the, of the SDR. And that's exactly uh, the what the Africa is expecting the most, to see those SDR, after what has been done during COVID, mm -hmm. uh, to help uh, accelerate the development of Africa, uh, fill the gap of financing for Africa. Uh, some of the SDR have been given to countries. Yep. We have been using it uh, for 
balance of payment support, but also for budget support for project, development project. We still need more. And uh, I know that some of the SDR uh, uh, went to RST, the RST uh, uh, fund, the trust fund. Uh, but we still need more. Uh, the yeah. development bank, uh, so I see the IMF is still reluctant to be more innovative in the, the use of those SDR, which can be a good response to the challenges. And also, we have so many uh, big project that we can call global project, yeah. uh, especially related to uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, supply of energy, and those projects can be funded by those SDR, but it's a matter of will. I, I think one of the things that's become most apparent to me is that many of the development gains that have been made over the past 30, 40 years have uh, are facing an uncertain future uh, because of global climate change. And with the... But that's an opportunity yeah, to it's, use it's, that money yeah, to fix some issues. Exactly. I was talking to you about Inga. Mm -hmm. Inga, uh, among others, we will need strong um, uh, guarantee to help the private sector or finance uh, institution to get involved in this project. How can we build those guarantees? Maybe those SDR can help, I don't know, but we need to find innovative solutions for that. Yeah. And INGA is one of the most relevant response to the, our climate uh, uh, the challenges yeah. at the world level. Well, Mr. Minister, let's stop there. I, I really thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. Is there anything else that you want to, to, to say you know, to our audience before I wrap up? No, the only thing I can say that uh, we are, uh, despite all the problems that we have, we, are, we have a very strong relation with the, the U.S., the country. Uh, you know, I met uh, Under Secretary Fernandez yesterday. We had a very good discussion on all the key issues, uh, minerals, uh, mm -hmm. sustainable growth, etc., partnership. But uh, we also have good relation with the international uh, the finance institution, World Bank and IMF. But we still need more and we need to go faster because of the challenges that we have. The youth of the population, and if uh, we don't go faster, uh, it can backfire yeah. on uh, forests, on uh, peace and stability. It becomes a very real problem. Absolutely, and things and that you apart face Apart from day. that, the only thing I can say is that uh, we have another sp uh, specific challenge that you know. It is the conflict in the East. Yeah which is fueled by, among others, by uh, smuggling our minerals, uh, which go through the, through the borders to other countries and sold outside uh, to big companies. And that is not fair for the country. We are missing money, we are missing peace. Uh, it's not acceptable. No. Well, let's have another conversation about that next time you're in Washington. I, uh, I want to say thank you for being a friend of the Africa Center. Um, as the preferred destination for African cultural, political, and business leaders who want to create a more authentic African narrative, the Atlantic Council is a powerful platform for a better knowledge of Africa and for the promotion of opportunities on the African continent. In recent weeks, the Africa Center has published groundbreaking analyses seeking to push more investment into African markets on social infrastructure, the importance of reducing the cost of data, the role of technology in agriculture, and later this week, ways to reform the international financial architecture to deliver better, stronger, more inclusive results for countries of the New South. You can find these and more on our website at www.AtlanticCouncil.org. Thanks for being part of this exciting conversation. Thank you. Thank you.